You're listening to Storytime in Paris on Paris Underground Radio. For more great content and to join our book club, please join us on Patreon. Since well before Victor Hugo looked up at Notre Dame and thought, huh, what if a hunchback lived in there? Authors have been inspired by Paris. Welcome to the Storytime in Paris podcast on Paris Underground Radio, where we keep that tradition alive by showcasing an author with a French connection in each episode. Every episode will feature five questions asked by you, our author's biggest fans, and answered live on air. Then our authors will treat us to a reading of an excerpt from their book. I'm your host, Jennifer Garrity. Would you like to join the Storytime in Paris book club? Head on over to patreon.com slash Paris Underground Radio and stay tuned to the end of this episode for more information. Welcome to the season three premiere of Storytime in Paris. I missed you in the break between seasons, but never fear. I have been reading voraciously. I've been trying to cast my net far and wide to find you the most interesting and diverse stories possible. And I could not be more thrilled with this season's lineup. My guest for this premiere is none other than the fabulous Natasha Lester. Natasha is a New York Times and USA Today bestselling author who won the Tag Hungerford Award for fiction for her first novel, What is Left Over After. Her books have been translated into multiple languages and are bestsellers all over the world. Her latest book, The Riviera House, is a beautifully written work of historical fiction inspired by a true story. In 1939, Eliane catalogued stolen art for the Nazis at the Jeux de Pomme while secretly smuggling information to the resistance. In the present day, Remy runs to the French Riviera in an effort to forget her loss, but discovers something that begins a mystery unraveling. Yet, no matter which timeline you're in, Natasha's writing is so rich and vibrant that you'll feel yourself fully immersed. Please allow me to introduce Natasha Lester, author of The Riviera House. Hello, Natasha. Thank you so much for joining me today all the way from Australia. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's such a delight to talk to you. So can you start by telling us a little bit about yourself and your work? Of course. So I, as you say, live in Australia. I've been writing and publishing books for about the last 12 years, actually. Wow, that's come fast. (laughs) Um, I (laughs) I mainly write historical fiction now. I've published six historical novels and I generally write novels about women doing something a bit unusual or extraordinary for their time in history. And I guess my main time period that I write about is sort of 1920s to 1940s, although lately it's been a lot of kind of wartime set novels, which is a period of huge time of change for women. So I really love writing about that sort of area. So yeah, so that's me in a nutshell. Did you always want to be a writer? I did. I am one of those cliched writers who from childhood wanted to be a writer. And in fact, my mum has kept all of these little books and poems and stories that I wrote from the time I was really young. So you can see that, you know, I'm not just making this stuff up. I've got all these like souvenirs of my childhood where I was constantly writing and constantly reading. And I remember vividly thinking, you know, every time I got completely submerged in a book, I always remember thinking, wow, imagine what it would be like to be able to do that for other people. And I think that's what drove me to want to be a writer, you know, since I was really young. So a lot of your books are set in France and a lot more even set specifically in Paris. What is it that draws, what is your connection to Paris and to France? Um, It's interesting. I don't have a particularly direct connection. I studied French, the language, in high school. And I remember I did history in high school as well, which obviously, again, ties into what I write these days. I loved French history in high school, thought it was fabulous. And then I kept up my French language studies outside of school. Once I went to university, I went to Alliance Francaise at night and I kept my language classes going. And then I started working for L'Oréal Paris. So French company. So again, was very much immersed in the French culture and again, continued my language classes through there and had to do a lot of translating of packaging. And we had the French come out to Australia a couple of times a year and that was lots of fun. So there's been a lot of French kind of touchstones, I guess, in my life. And then when I started writing, I suppose that my first book that was really set partly in France was The Paris Seamstress and that just happened to come about through a a turn of events in terms of what I wanted to write about in that book and then it just made 
complete sense to me that I continued to keep that theme going in some way in my books because when I'm needing to research materials, if they're in French, I can read the language, I can read the materials. I love the city. I love the country. We go there every year for holidays. I haven't for the last two years, obviously, but prior to COVID and come September, we, we'll be back again. So it's just, I love the language. I love the history. I love the culture. I think coming from somewhere like Australia, which is a, such a new country and doesn't have the cultural heritage of centuries like France does, that's particularly attractive for someone like me. I, I agree. I come from America, so it's a similar sort of thing where yeah. we just don't have the same depth of history. We don't. You can't see it layered in in the way that it is here. And so much of Paris it has been untouched. Yes, through the years that you can wander around and really imagine what it was like a hundred years. Exactly. Ago. Yeah, and I love that as a historical fiction writer because you can literally walk in the footsteps of your characters because the buildings are exactly the same, the streets are the same. It's all there. You know, just block out the the cars, then you're fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So can you tell us a little bit about the Riviera House? Of course. So the Riviera House is about a young woman called Eliane Dufour, who is a young art lover. And the book opens just before the fall of France to the Germans in 1940. And at that time, Eliane is transferred from the Louvre to work at a different Parisian art museum, the Jeu de Pomme. And when Eliane walks to the museum for her very first day at work, she's quite shocked to see that it's surrounded by armed Nazis. She has no idea why an art museum would need to be guarded by soldiers. And then when she walks into the museum, she sees gathered inside this astonishing collection of artworks, more art than any of the largest museums in the world could possibly gather together for an exhibition. And she doesn't know where the art has come from and why it's there. And so she joins forces with a woman who's inspired by a real person, Rose Valland, to work out where the Nazis are getting these artworks from and what they plan to do with them. And it basically sets them up to become art spies in a way, I suppose you could say, spying on the Nazis' art thieving that actually took place in Paris during the Second World War. So that I've collected some questions for you, and that leads me very naturally into the first question. So I knew very little about what happened to the confiscate, well, I guess stolen art during the Nazi occupation. And I loved getting to see behind the scenes and into the Louvre and the École de Louvre and the Jeu de Pomme. Can you talk a little bit about the research that you did for the book? Yes. So there was a lot of research, actually, because the the papers to do with the Nazi art thefts during the Second World War are kept in you know, lots of archives scattered throughout many, many different countries. So you're suddenly looking at this massive collection of paperwork. So from a research point of view, it was narrowing down to what specifically I wanted to focus on, which was primarily to do with the art thefts in France and particularly within Paris. So I started out at the Musée National Archives, where a lot of the paperwork to do with particularly Rose Valland and the, the Jeu de Pomme is kept. For example, uh, all of Rose's original notebooks where she was recording all the details of the stolen artworks are available at the Musée National Archives to have a look at, as is the complete evacuation plan for the Louvre at this just before World War II started. So I was able to see photographs of the winged victory of Samothrace being taken down the Daru staircase, for example, which, as wow. you know, is a scene in the book. In fact, that's the one I'm going to read a little bit later. So I was really able to visualise a lot of the events that take place in the book and, and just, you know, being able to see, you know, Rose Vallon's handwriting from 1942 where she's transcribing the names of these paintings that have been stolen from the Jewish families of Paris is quite an extraordinary research experience. Obviously, I also went to the Jeu de Pomme Museum, which obviously the exterior is still the same, but the in interior is very different. But I've been able to get hold of a, a plan of the uh, the galleries, the way they were laid out in the 1940s. And I particularly wanted to, I guess, stand in the space where the, the Salle des Martyrs was located, which was the Rose Valland called the room that. It was the room where all the Impressionist artworks were placed by the Nazis because they believed Impressionist and Modernist work was degenerate and it wasn't the kind of artwork they wanted to see or have displayed. And so there was this room hoarding these Van Goghs and these Matisses and these Rodins and all these amazing sculptures and paintings that we would just, you know, marvel at today. And they were all, you know, locked up in this room. And so I wanted to kind of stand in that place. And, and so I did that, worked out where it would have been within the gallery and, and 
interestingly, I think it still feels like a really haunted place. Like you can tell that something something quite terrible happened there at some point in history. So those kinds of things are important, particularly researching Rory. She was a bit tricky to research because there's not a lot about her personal life on the record. So to access her as a character, uh, I wanted to, and again, within the, the Jeu de Pont Museum, I guess, you know, if you look at it on a map, you might be able to work out that through those big arched windows along the Jardin de Tuileries, you can see the Eiffel Tower through those windows. But it's not until you really stand there. And I was there, the night I was there, it was December, so the sun was going down pretty early. It was about four o'clock and there was this beautiful orange sunset. And through the arch windows, you'd see orange sky and the Eiffel Tower sort of silhouetted against that orange sky. And it was this magical, beautiful sight. But for me, it was all about thinking, you know, imagine being Rose Valland and standing in that same window looking out at that same view as she must have done, but with armed Nazis behind you and how different would that feel? So that's why I always want to do on the ground research because it's those moments like that that get you to be able to access the way your character might feel about something as, you know, symbolic of Paris as the Eiffel Tower being viewed in a very different way um, during the 1940s to how we might view it now. So I did a lot of archival based research, a lot of actual on the ground research. I'd been to the Galerie Vero Doda years before where Eliane's apartment is located in the book and I had walked past that arched doorway with the 33 escalier sign above the portal, the mahogany portal, and I'd seen that curving staircase through that portal and I'd wanted to write about someone who lived at the top of that staircase ever since I had seen that. So (laughs) I went back there to the Galerie Vero Doda, saw where the brasserie was located in relation to the apartments and the stairs and and took lots of photos there because then when you get home, all of those photos become this resource that you just draw on when you're writing. So, yeah, so a mix of different types of research, all of which I find really important to kind of layer into the story and hopefully make it as, as authentic as possible. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. And so Rose was a real, she's based on a real person. And Eliane, was she also a real person? No. So I made Eliane up. And the main reason I did that was because, as I mentioned before, Rose was tricky to write about because while she wrote a memoir, and which was only available in French, of course, as, as are so many of these things. So I, I read it through in, in French. She very detailed about the day-to-day details of her life at the Jeu de Pont Museum during the war, how she recorded the artworks, what happened, but she never takes the reader outside the museum to, to her home, to her friends, to what she did on the weekend. So when you're writing a character in a book, you, you can't just set the whole book inside just the museum. You have to take the reader outside for a change of pace. You have to let the reader into the character's personal space, not just their work life. And so for me, to then make Rose the main character of the book would have meant that I would have had to make up so much of her because that stuff just simply wasn't on the record that I would have felt like I would have had trouble calling her Rose Valland because really there was going to be a lot of fictional information there. So I thought, okay, well, to get around that problem, I still want Rose to be there because she's so important and I wanted people to know about her. But I would invent the character of Eliane to work alongside Rose so that I could then have someone who could leave the museum and could have another layered personal life alongside the difficulty and the, um, the danger of what uh, she and Rose were doing at the museum. I mean, you know, as happens in the book, Rose was threatened with being taken to the German border and being liquidated. She was fired from the museum multiple times. You know, she lived in constant threat of her life. But and the thing that most interests me about Rose, which I think must sum up her character, is that she was fired from the museum four times And she was able to go back each time because she played this role of this being very submissive, almost like this little quiet mouse of a woman who nobody noticed. And so she would just, she would be fired and then she would just wait for a couple of weeks and then she would just go back to the museum and and go through the doors and people would kind of forget that they had fired her. But what made me so interested in that is how many of us would have done that, you know? So the first time she was fired, okay, it was about a year or so into her tenure at the Jeu de Pomme, and you would have gone, okay, well, I really tried. I tried to record the details of these art thefts. I've written down as many notes as I can, but now I've been fired. Now I can go and just do something safer. But she didn't. She went back. 
And not only that, she went back another three times after subsequently being fired and fired again. But wow, that's that is courage. Like that is heroic. You know, most of us would not have done that. We would have given up at the first kind of hurdle. And that to me spoke so much about her character and, and what kind of person that she must have been. And for me, it was a truly brave act. Absolutely, especially since you detail in the book how when there's one act of resistance, they'll end up killing 10 people because of it or your entire family, everyone you care about. Yeah, I think that's absolutely heartbreaking. And of course, you know, the Nazis knew exactly what they were doing when they made those kinds of decisions that you had to you had to, as a resistant, realise you weren't just putting your life on the line, you're putting the lives of all of your loved ones on the line too. And that's a that's a big burden to carry. So yes, Rose was particularly brave to continue to resist in the face of knowing how much danger she was putting everybody she loved in. Is Paris the most romantic city in the world? Host Lily Heisey answers this very question in her podcast, Romancing in Paris which takes you through the city, arrondissement by arrondissement, by exploring the most romantic and hidden spots Paris has to offer. Listen now to Romancing in Paris on parisundergroundradio.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll be right back with Storytime in Paris after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to Storytime in Paris. So knowing how much respect you have for her and what she did, how do you strike the balance between preserving the historical parts of your story and weaving the narrative? I I mean, I guess at the end of the day, it, you know, it's a novel. And so in theory, you can just make everything up, can't you? But for me, when I'm writing, when I'm choosing to write about things that actually happened, I try to stick as much as I possibly can to what really did happen, particularly when you're writing about you know, resistance, heroines, and something as sensitive as the theft of Jewish artworks, which is, you know, still going on through the generations today. There are still artworks missing, still artworks being found that families are having to fight for. So when you're dealing with subject matter that, you know, really is deeply personal for so many people, I like to feel that I'm being as accurate as I possibly can. And but of course, when you're writing a novel, there are questions of pace that you need to address for the reader's sake, uh, because if you actually write everything that happened in the order that it happened, sometimes, you know, those details can become slow and we can't have that in a novel. So you have to make some choices sometimes between the needs of the narrative given that it's a novel versus what actually happened. And so what I always do is include a really extensive author's note at the end, noting where I've had to change history for various reasons and and why I've done that. And I know, you know, again, you don't really have to do that because it's a novel. So really we could just assume that it's all made up. But I think part of the interest for me in my books, and, and this is what I like about other historical novels that follow in this kind of vein, is that you know, you feel like you are learning something about a time in history. And that just makes the fictional narrative all the more interesting. So when there are things that have happened in history during the Second World War, for example, that are deeply interesting, why mess with those facts that are inherently dramatic already and, you know, make for fascinating stories and have true heroes attached to them. So so I try to be as respectful and as truthful as I can within the needs of it needing to only be 450 pages and not be 1,000 pages and for readers to want to continue reading the book. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> your, your writing is very beautiful and you go into a real emotional depth that most people, I feel like even most writers would shy away from. And you talk about love and lovemaking and grief with such, I'm not even sure what the right word is, depth or honesty or vulnerability. And so my question is about your writing process. How do you get to those places? Do you start with an image or a scent or music? Like, how do you get to that place? Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? You know, I often think writing is a little bit... uh, And I I hesitate to use words like magical or alchemical because it makes people think that it makes people think of that idea of the muse and that you just have to wait for inspiration and, and it will all pour into your head and there's no work involved. And that's absolutely not the case at all. There is so much hard work and sweat and perspiration, but 
there is also some magic and some kind of alchemy that happens where I find that in every book there will be some kind of gift and that gift alters. Sometimes it's a character, sometimes it's a, a setting, sometimes it's a plot point, that you know, a twist that comes out of nowhere. And, and in this book for me, the gift was actually the contemporary storyline, um, which is normally the one I find the hardest to write because it doesn't always have the drama of the historical narrative because it's not happening in wartime, which is inherently dramatic. But for, what, for whatever reason, the muse decided to gift me the contemporary storyline in this book, which I think really helped because having that fall into place so beautifully meant that I could really throw all of my energies into digging as deeply as I possibly could in those historical scenes that needed it. And also, I think that just reading, particularly reading contemporary accounts of survivors who are struggling to get back their artworks and how, just how despairing they are and how hard they have to fight to get back something that they own just those kinds of emotions fed into the writing of the book. And so I try to, I guess, immerse myself in all of those things. You know, someone might say, well, reading a contemporary perspective of someone who's trying to track down an artwork is not relevant to the historical storyline, but it is because it shows us the legacy of those things that happened. And if we understand that those repercussions go on for decades, you know, even nearly a century, then it makes us dig deeper into making sure that we get that onto the page when we're writing that historical narrative. So I don't know whether that's a really a very good answer for that question because it is a little bit mysterious and I don't really know often how it works, but I guess it's just opening yourself up to writing whatever, not being scared. I think the things that you're most scared of, you have to write. People will criticise books written by women where people fall in love because it's, you know, it becomes girly or, or romancy and that's used in a negative sense. And I don't think romance novels are negative at all. You know, I think they're amazing works of literature like every other work of literature. So you're aware of all those things, but I think if you shy away from those things and you're not being truthful to, you know, people fall in love in wartime and that's often a lot of the time how they get through. So if you don't show those things then you're you're missing out on a, a part of the person's character that readers I think would love to get to know. I think that's true. But also in our own lives, we experience love and sadness and grief and joy. And so to see that reflected honestly in a piece of work is validating too. It's it's nice to see that instead of being told, oh, love is always a cliche. And if you fall in love, you're just a stupid girl. You know, it's nice to see the honesty. Yeah, I agree. And I've got two daughters. And so I'm particularly conscious of this idea of wanting them to understand that women falling in love can be a powerful thing. It's not yeah. a weakness and it's not, and also there's a way to look at it that is different to kind of the masculine way of looking at things, which I think we get fed too often. And and if we as women then don't then put forward our own points of view because we're scared of being branded as a romance writer or whatever, then all that's left is the male point of view. And, and I think that sometimes that's really damaging for women. So I guess I'm trying to make the world a better place for my girls by writing these kinds of stories in some peculiar way. <laughs> that's beautiful. Your words have so much color and texture. And I think oftentimes when I'm reading a book that has different timelines and, and characters that often one world seems much brighter and more defined than the other, while the other is a little bit sketchier. And sometimes I have to reorient myself. Okay, now I'm in this time period. Who are the characters? Where are we? What's going on? And I never had to do that with your book. Your writing is so visceral, so textural. I always knew exactly where I was. I could picture everything so vividly. So I guess, thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> When you're writing, do you write one timeline at a time or do you write them both simultaneously? I do write them one timeline at a time because my brain can't function with jumping around and then I'll structure them later. And I think, again, that's really important to just, I want to be completely immersed in those characters and that time period and that setting when I'm writing about them. So I have to write the whole um, narrative out. And also for me, because I, I'm i not able to plan a book up front my writing process doesn't work like that. I have to write the story to 
for figure out what the story actually is. So I couldn't switch back and forth in the way that it does in the actual printed book because then I would completely lose the thread of the story. So I have to go, okay, well, let's write out the historical narrative. It usually comes first for me um, because that's kind of the bedrock, I suppose. And so I write all of that out and then I'll write the full contemporary narrative out. But I guess, you know, in terms of the way that works, again, you know, so largely the contemporary narrative is set in Saint-Jean Cap Ferrat. And I, I'm so happy to hear that it it you felt real and authentic to you because I I went down there and I spent a lot of time in it's such a beautiful part of the world because again I wanted to feel like that I want the reader to feel like they're actually there and they're actually seeing that house and and that coastline and and that ocean so again tons of photos that I took while I was down there which is not a hardship at all because there's plenty of picturesque <laughs> scenery down there. <laughs> Because I wanted, yeah, readers to feel like, particularly I think, you know, over pandemic times, to feel like they were having a bit of an escape, an escape to somewhere mm. beautiful. I think that actually was quite nice timing in, in some senses. Yeah. One of, our, one of your readers asked about your editing process. So what is that process like for you? What was it like with regards to this book? And was there anything that you had to leave out? Um, <laughs> so much that I had to leave out. <laughs> I always submit drafts that are too long and I always know they're too long. But I, I think the thing is because you I've written all of this kind of stuff, I guess you could call it, into this narrative, you get to a point where you can't tell anymore which parts are essential and which parts aren't. And that's where the editor comes in and is able to say, not even say, I think you should cut this, but ask questions or what is this part achieving? Why is this part in here? And then that makes you ask that question and think, oh, actually, I don't need that in there at all. So certainly the draft I hand into the editor always has much more research laid into it. And it's a matter of passing that back because I become utterly obsessed by whatever I'm writing about. So there's always more information in that draft than I can possibly really include for the reader and I have to kind of pare that back a bit which is such a shame but it gives me lots of stuff to talk about in the the talks afterwards I can kind of put in all the (laughs) the the bits that didn't make it into the book so so the editing is a lot about working out especially for this one it was the main focus was making sure one of the things I, I try to do as much as possible is make sure the story is paramount and the research is just there you don't it's not intruding on the story you don't feel like you're being taught anything it's just all a part of the world in fact and so it was just getting that balance right was the biggest part of this one for me also interestingly there was a whole other point of view character when I submitted this book to my publisher who had to be cut we didn't like cutting her because she was a great character but I didn't need her and in fact Angelique Eliane's sister took over a little bit of that role in the end so yeah so hopefully I'll get to resurrect this character in some other book at some other time because she was a pretty great character but she she wasn't needed in this book it's terrible kill your darlings <laughs> i know <laughs> yeah yeah she was a bit of a darling but she's dead <laughs> are you as obsessed with french food wine and cheese as i am if so you may be interested in the terroir podcast hosts culinary journalist emily monaco and chef and wine expert caroline connor Explore the links between the foods, wines, and more to the places they're from and the people who make them. Listen now to the Terroir Podcast on parisundergroundradio.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll be right back with Storytime in Paris after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to Storytime in Paris. All right, I have a bonus question for you. Through your writing, it's clear that you have a love of art and fashion and photography. Do you have a favorite piece of art or a favorite artist? Oh, (laughs) that is such a hard question, isn't it? (laughs) It's interesting. I think through writing the Riviera House, I developed an entirely different appreciation for some artworks that were particularly familiar to me, like even just the Mona Lisa. When I went to the Musée National Archives and saw the photographs of how she was transported out of the museum and photographs of the curator sleeping next to the Mona Lisa at the different chateaux and abbeys that she was stored at throughout the war and, you know, read this, there was this one particular story that really stood out. Had to move the Mona Lisa from the Locdure Abbey where she had been stored because the humidity was starting to uh, damage the wood that 
the Mona Lisa is painted on. And so because the humidity was a problem, they transported her in the back of this hermetically sealed van to keep out all, all the air, which is great for a painting, but not for a human being. But they put a curator into the back of the hermetically sealed van with the Mona Lisa so that by the time they reached the next destination, he was unconscious, um, which is kind of macabrely funny. But it just, that illustrated to me the commitment these people had to keeping these artworks safe. They were literally willing to put their lives on the line. And so, you know, I'd seen the Mona Lisa many times at the Louvre before, but I went back to have a look at her after learning all of this about her. And I, she just was a different painting after all that. Same with Vermeer's Astronomer in the Louvre, which was one of the paintings stolen from the Rothschilds that transited through the Jeu de Pomme Museum, was recorded in um, Rose Vallon's diaries, was destined for Hitler's Führer Museum, you know, had a swastika stamped onto its back. I went back to the Louvre to have another look at that. Again, completely different painting because the story made that just so much more meaningful to me, I suppose. So so I guess, you know, it, it was really interesting the way story influenced my viewing of particular familiar artworks. One of my two favourites in Paris would be the Nymphaeus at the L'Orangerie um, Monet. I mean, that is just standing in that room is just magnificent. And also I love Rodin's, the Musée Rodin in the gardens, all those. I just could sit there and stare at those for hours. So those are particular favourites. And I guess it's it's that sense of being immersed in the artwork that you get in those two particular places. You're not just standing in front of one painting. You are surrounded by art and beauty and it's literally filling all your senses. Those are my two favourites as well. Oh, wow. You have excellent <laughs> taste. <laughs> Speaking of excellent taste, I think you're going to read to us from your book now. Is there anything that we need to know contextually before you do? So this scene takes place very early on in the book and it's part of, um, it takes place during the evacuation of the Louvre at the end of August 1939, when the Louvre is basically emptied of all of its artworks and they're sent off to the countryside to be kept safe from the advancing German armies. So Eliane is at the Louvre helping to, helping to move those artworks out, which is about all you really need to know to make sense of the scene, I suppose. Near dawn, the winged victory of Samothrace, almost six metres tall and made of 118 pieces of marble, was moved from her home atop the Daru staircase. She shone that morning, alabaster wings extended, a goddess reminding them that battles could be won and that humans didn't just wage war, they made things of magnificence too. Ropes attached to a wooden frame surrounding the statue were hoisted, pulleys turned inch by inch, and victory rose into the air. She was set down upon a ramp, built over the staircase, and, once aboard, thirty tons of statue descended. Some people turned their heads away and covered their eyes. Eliane barely breathed. Xavier stood beside her, and for the whole time, long and slow and endless, it took to move victory down fifty-three steps. She could feel his heart racing. The gasps of the crowd magnified every teeter, every totter. Victory could not fall. Something touched Eliane's hand, Xavier's fingers intertwined with hers. She held on. Just three more steps. Two. The very last step. Finally, the statue was safe at the bottom of the staircase. She had not broken into a thousand pieces. The collective sigh of those gathered to watch was the sweetest sound, like a hymn, picked up by the stone walls of the empty room, singing on and on. I want to believe it's a promise, Eliane said to Xavier, nodding at the exultant goddess, that war won't come and nobody will die. I want that too. But around them it looked as if the war had already begun. Sandbags were piled up against the statues too large to move. Pieces of wood lay strewn about like the debris of an explosion, and people marched past with grim faces. And she suddenly knew, the same way she could sense when Yolande was sick, waking in the middle of the night to feel her little sister's forehead, that the promise she wished for would be broken. War was coming. It was only a question of when, and whether any of them would, afterwards, be able to watch victory reascend the staircase, alive and intact and victorious. Beautiful. 
Thank you. <laughs> so I heard a whisper that you have a new book in the works. Is there anything you can tell us about that? I do. So I have a book coming out in September in Australia and in January in North America. Uh, it's called The Three Lives of Alex St. Pierre. And this one takes place largely in France and in Switzerland and Italy as well. This one is primarily set post-war. I was really interested in women's lives after the war because women had such responsibility during the war and were doing all kinds of incredible things. But then the minute the war ended and the men came home and took back their jobs, women were, they were propaganda posters, basically advocating for women to quit their jobs and return to cooking roast dinners in the kitchen and, and being wives. And I just thought, wow, how would that have felt? You know, if you'd been a spy, for example, doing top secret work and to suddenly be told that actually you, you are only needed to cook your husband's dinner, like that must have been soul destroying. So I wanted to write about that time for women and what, and that kind of very regressive era just post the Second World War. So it's a little bit about that. It's also partly set during the Second World War as well. And my main character, Alex St. Pierre, is the new publicity director at the just opening House of Christian Dior in Paris in 1947. So lots of fabulous fashion and fun in that one. <laughs> fabulous. All right. Well, I will look forward to that for sure. <laughs> and how can people keep up to date with you and your books? I, you can find me on my website at natashalester.com.au. I'm also on Instagram at Natasha Lester Author and Facebook as Natasha Lester Author as well. Um, and I love it when readers do get in touch and ask me questions about my books and um, let me know what they're reading. It's always fascinating to me. Fabulous. Thank you so much. I'll put all the links down so that everybody can get to you very easily. Thank you so much, Natasha. Thank you for speaking with me today. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you again to Natasha Lester for being our season three premiere guest. You can find Natasha on her website, natashalester.com.au and on Facebook and Instagram at Natasha Lester Author. Please join me next week when my guest will be author Scott Kershaw. Check back next week to see if your questions have been answered and to hear a reading from his book, The Game. If you'd like to keep the conversation going, please join the Storytime in Paris book club where you'll meet a different guest author each month and get to speak with them directly about their work. For more information, please visit patreon.com slash Paris Underground Radio. I'm your host, Jennifer Garrity, and you can find me on all socials at Jenny Foria. That's J-E-N-N-Y-P-H-O-R-I-A. And on my website, jennyforia.com. Storytime in Paris is produced by me as part of the Paris Underground Radio Podcast Network. To check out interviews with previous guests or to discover more great Paris-based podcasts, please visit parisundergroundradio.com. Thank you, and until next time, happy reading! This episode of Storytime in Paris was produced by Jennifer Garrity for Paris Underground Radio. For more on this show and shows like it, please visit parisundergroundradio.com.